Thank you very much, Hamid, and thanks everyone for coming back. Um, last time I was talking about learning in one-shot simultaneous move games, and we said that you shouldn't necessarily expect Nash equilibrium the first time people play a game, but if they play the game repeatedly, observe what's happened, play stabilizes, then it would converge to the Nash equilibrium. These are the, the possible stable long run points. So today I'm going to continue talking about learning in games, talk about learning in extensive form games. So there's three things, three parts to what I'd like to do. First, I'll just remind you of what an extensive form game is. Uh, most of you probably already know, um, and how to talk about Nash equilibrium in extensive form games. I will then talk about learning in extensive form games and say that if our agents engage only in passive learning, they simply see the information that comes in but don't change their play to change their information, then in fact, um, learning need not lead to Nash equilibrium. It could instead lead to any of a larger set of self-confirming equilibrium. Okay, that's... Um, and finally, I'll say, well, suppose that players aren't so passive and they try to learn about what happens not only on the path of play but off the path of play, what can happen then? So that's, that's what I hope to do. And hopefully I'll get to the end of a talk so I can tell you about the code of Hammurabi. Okay, so extensive form games. So an extensive form game, strategies are now going to be complete contingent plans. Remember I said last, last time I said think of strategies as being buttons on a keyboard or up, down in our matrices. Now strategies are complete contingent plans. What does that mean? It means the strategy is a rule that says what the agent would do in every contingency the agent could possibly face. The formal name for these contingencies is information sets. I'll be sort of defining these by example without doing it formally. Okay? Um, so the, in this formalism, the actions that players end up choosing could end up depending on the actions of others. We could have a sequential move game where player one moves, two sees player one's move and responds. So player two's action is not simultaneous with player one's action. But nevertheless, we can think of the players as choosing their strategies simultaneously. Yes. In order to define an extensive form game, we have to define this collection of information sets or contingencies, we have to find actions, payoff functions, and the easiest way to explain it um, is with an example. So here's an example. This tree on the top is the way that we normally represent extensive form games. So player one moves first, playing up or down. If player one goes up, there's a dot there with an numeral two. Player two gets to move and chooses either A or B. If player one goes down, then two gets a move, choosing either C or D. And there's these two separate states for player two Two separate things that player two could know are two different information sets for player two, these nodes. Okay. So at the end of a tree, I've written the payoffs for each, each path through the tree, where the first number is player one's payoff, the second number is player two's. We can go from this extensive form to the, the strategic form. Okay, player one has a single choice set, single information state. He moves first, up or down. So he has only two strategies. Player two has two different information sets, the top one and the bottom one. At each set, player two has two choices. Therefore, player two has four different strategies in this game, namely A at the top and C at the bottom, A at the top, D at the bottom, B, C, B, D. Four choices. What are the payoffs? Well, if one goes up, then they get two regardless. That's pretty simple. If one goes down, now it matters whether two plays C or D. If one goes down and two plays C, which is the column A, C, and B, C, 
the payoffs are three and zero. Otherwise, the payoffs are one and zero. So that's how we go from the extensive form to the strategic form. Once we've got the strategic form, we can look at its Nash equilibria just like we were doing last time. Nash equilibrium is still a strategy profile where given the strategy profile, no player can gain by changing their play. So what are the pure Nash equilibria here? Well, it's, it's down and AC looks like an equilibrium because one doesn't want to change, trading three for two, and two doesn't want to change, two gets zero regardless. So that's a Nash equilibrium. So is down and B comma C. That's also a Nash equilibrium. There's also a Nash equilibrium where player one goes up and player two plays D. So it's this up AD is an equilibrium and up BD is an equilibrium. So let's take this one. Player two can't change his payoff, completely indifferent. Player one can only make things worse. So this is a set of Nash equilibria is perfectly well defined. We can analyze them. The definition of Nash equilibrium applies unchanged, even though now we're applying it not to actions, but to strategy profiles. And it's no longer the case that the when player one changes his action, we don't hold two's action fixed. We hold two's strategy fixed. But of course, if one plays down instead of up, that could change two's action. So the definition of Nash equilibrium extends fine. However, the long run outcome of learning matters. Those two games are not equivalent from the viewpoint of learning. Why not? Well, in the bottom game, if we had everyone write their strategies and put them in those boxes. Okay, we pulled out player two strategy from a box. We'd say, ah, AC. And we'd all know that that player two had played AC. In actuality, if player one plays up and two plays A, player one does not get to see what player two would have done if player two had played D. Okay? So in the strategic form, Player one observes two strategy. Learning leads to Nash equilibrium as before. But if we play this game in the extensive form and player one sees only player two's action, then learning could lead only to the larger set of self-confirming equilibria. So let me define that. So no, it's the second lecture. I understand I get to use, use uh, notation. So I'll be a, a bit more formal. Um, the key concept for today is the idea of an information set being reached. Okay. An information set is reached by a strategy profile if it's hit with positive probability. So, so if your pure strategy profile is very easy. Either information set is hit or it's not hit. If it's a mixed strategy profile, then maybe this information set is hit with probably a third. It still counts as being reached. Any non-zero probability will count. Okay. If it's reached with probability zero, we'll say it's unreached or off the path of this profile. Let a probability measure for each player i, let mu i describe player i's beliefs about the opponent's play. Okay. And let sigma be a mixed strategy profile, where each sigma i corresponds to a probability distribution over the pure strategies of player i. So one third up, two thirds down, for example. And as, and as yesterday, this distribution will could either be because player one is spinning a spinner with weights one third, two thirds, um, rolling dice, or because there's many agents in the role of player one, and one third of them are playing up and two thirds are playing down. If players don't observe opponents play at these unreached information sets, then they might not learn it, right? If you, it's hard to learn about something that you have no data about. But then their actions might not be optimal given the way that the opponents would respond to deviations. Okay? So self-confirming equilibrium formalizes this. It requires that agents have correct beliefs about what happens on the path of play. They, they know what happens given what they themselves are doing, given what they see. 
but it allows the agents to have incorrect beliefs about things they don't see. So this is in the spirit of Frank Hahn's work on conjectural equilibrium. So to find this formally, a strategy profile sigma is a self-confirming equilibrium, I'll say SCE, if for each player i and every strategy SI that has positive weight, there are some beliefs mu i which can depend on SI with the following two properties. The strategy SI should be optimal for player i given his beliefs. So player i believes opponents are playing according to mu i, writes down the expected utility function, and SI should be a maximizer. The second condition is that this belief, mu i, should be consistent with what the player sees when he actually plays SI. But more formally, this belief is correct at every information set that is reached when player i plays SI and everyone else's play is described by sigma minus i. Okay, so I've just defined this equilibrium concept. I'm going to um, relate it to learning in a bit, but first let me explore the implications of this concept a bit and gloss it for you. So Nash equilibrium says play is optimal, each player's strategy is optimal given the opponent's strategy. Well, a more verbose way of rephrasing that is to say Nash equilibrium is equivalent to the combination of two conditions. The first one is the same condition A as on the last slide, play is optimal given beliefs. The second one is that Beliefs are correct everywhere. Each player knows the opponent's strategy. So Nash equilibrium, play is the best response to beliefs. Beliefs are correct. Self-confirming equilibrium, play is the best response to beliefs. And beliefs are correct on the path of play, but could be arbitrary off the path of play. If we have a static game, like the games we were playing last time, each player has a single uncontingent action, then each player has a single information set which is always reached, regardless of opponent's play. So Nash equilibrium and self-confirming equilibrium are equivalent in the games we were talking about yesterday. Okay. This next bullet point is more of a, a, an aside I could even put off till, till, till the break. The definition of self-confirming equilibrium says that players' beliefs are correct on the path and are wrong, the things they don't see. In, you can think of situations where players get even less information that is implicit here. Players might not observe enough to have correct beliefs even on the path of play. An example of this is a sealed bid auction. Suppose that we all put bids in the hat and the auctioneer announces the winning bid. Then you don't learn the bids of anyone else. So in fact, that's not enough information to even tell you the terminal node that was reached or all the information set. So it's easy to think of cases where people have less information than, than in self confirmed equilibrium. It's maybe harder to think of cases where they have more. Now, something that hopefully caught your eye in the definition was the quantifier, we said, for each SI, there are beliefs mu i. So that lets player i have different beliefs when he's playing different strategies. So that might seem a little odd. If player one is one guy, how can he sometimes think this and sometimes think that? Okay? And if there is a single player one, it doesn't make so much sense. The reason for this, this, this um, flexibility of definition is we want to capture situations with many player ones and many player twos, which argued was important for motivating the whole learning program. So if it's many player ones, it's possible some player ones play one way 
and learn something. Other player ones play a different way and learn something else. And in fact, I'm going to argue these heterogeneous beliefs, different player eyes having the same beliefs, having different beliefs, is important for making sense of a lot of experimental data. So here's a trivial example of the impact of heterogeneous beliefs. Not interesting, but just to explain the mechanics. I'm going to show you a game with an outcome which is not a Nash equilibrium. So suppose that you ran this experiment and you saw that half the time we ended up with player one playing out. That was half the time we observed one played in and two played A. So that's not a Nash equilibrium. Because if given that distribution, that means every time two is reached, two is playing A. If the player ones knew that, they should play in. You can't have half the player ones playing out in Nash equilibrium if twos are playing A. But how could this outcome arise? Well, some of the player ones play in, learn that two play A, say, I'm happy playing in, three is great, they stick with it. Some player ones began the experiment thinking, ah, probably the player twos are nasty guys playing B. I'm going to play out. And if they play out, and all they see is what happens in their own play, okay, they played out, they got their payoff. The next period they play out, get the payoff. There's never any information to get them to change their play. So this could be a stable outcome of a learning process. You could rule this out. You could impose what's called unitary SCE and say that for each player I only gets to have one belief. You can't have different beliefs for a single player role. Well, that of course makes sense if it really is a single player I. It would also make sense if all the player ones got to pool their information. So one way that self-confirming equilibrium can differ from Nash is this heterogeneous beliefs I just showed you. But even if we rule out heterogeneity and require that all players in a role have the same beliefs, this unitary SCE, there could be Nash equilibria, sorry, self-confirming equilibria that are not Nash because two players disagree about the play of a third. So here's an example, so, as, um, is it Hamid or Jan was saying, this is Sultan's horse game. Get the, um, so in this game, player one can play down or across. If one plays down, now, we see an example of an information set. There's two different circles with a dashed line between them. And what that means is, if player three gets to move, three doesn't know which of the two nodes we're at. Okay. So one goes down, three gets to move. If he goes across, two can play either down or across. And then we have the payoffs. So both one and two playing across is the outcome of a self-confirming equilibrium. Why? If one thinks that player three is probably playing right, one says, hmm, one looks better than zero, I'll play across. If player two thinks that player three is playing left, then two says, you know, I could have one or I could have zero, I like one, they both play across. If they both play across, they aren't getting any information. So that's why this is consistent with self-confirming equilibrium. Um, it's not the outcome of a Nash equilibrium. In any Nash equilibrium, one and two have to think the same thing about three, wh whatever it is. But whatever three is playing, there's either going to be weight more than a third on left or weight more than a third on right. There can't be weight less than a third on both. And if there's weight more than a third on left, then one wants to go down. If there's weight more than a third on right, then two wants to go down. So it's not Nash, it is self-confirming. And looking ahead a bit, See these threes pay off here is x at this node and y here. Suppose that players one and two knew player three's payoff function and use that to restrain their beliefs, not only observational data but payoff information. Okay. If x and y are both negative, then players one and two know that player three prefers left to right, so then one should go down. But if x and y have the opposite sign, then it's not so clear. Because then player three wants to play right at one information set and left at the other. And what player three will do will depend on player three's beliefs about which node he's at. And if historically one and two have only gone across, then three has no data to base the beliefs on. One and two have 
no data to base their beliefs about three's beliefs on. There's no, no particular reason um, for them to know what three will do. Um, so in self-confirming equilibrium, the only constraint on the predictions is observations of play. Um, if you wanted to put in path information, we could, um, we could do that as well. And here's a reference, and let me skip it because I'm um, interest of time. Um, in looking at experimental data, we should distinguish between play that's inconsistent with maximizing the presumed utility functions and play that's optimal for self-confirming but incorrect beliefs. An example of this, there have been many experiments on ultimatum bargaining. So player one has 10, has a mount, say 10 pounds, has to make a division. He offers player two some piece of it, x pounds, keeping one, 10 minus x. If player two accepts, they both get the money. If player two rejects, they both get zero. In experiments, low offers are typically rejected. If it's a 10 pound thing and you offer player two only one, you'll be rejected. That's a bad idea, okay? But not all the player ones make the payoff maximizing choice. So typically, the payoff maximizing thing to do in these experiments is to keep about 60% for yourself. It varies country to country, 55, 60. Or 50 is always accepted, but you can increase it a bit, and it's, it, it's typically worth it. But there's a range of player one offers. They aren't all making the same offer, okay? Um, and our explanation is the player ones don't know the exact probability that a given offer is accepted, which I think is quite plausible. Um, Okay, because the twos are rejecting the payoffs for some sort of social preferences, reputation, altruism, reason. There's a distribution of preferences about this. As an experimenter, you don't know what the distribution will be the first time you end the experiment with a given group. How could the subjects know, right? Um, the literature is focused on the losses of player twos. The player twos who say no are losing money. That's true. They cannot be utility maximizers. But there's also the losses of the player ones who are making, who are, offering 50-50 instead of 60-40, or offer, offering, trying to take all of it and being rejected. And those losses are typically three to five times larger than the losses of the player twos. So, so they're important in the data, and they're not consistent with Nash equilibrium. And they're not consistent because they have a Bayesian equilibrium. Some player twos are altruistic and some are normal. But if you have a, a prior on that and the ones Novus distribution, they're all going to make the same offers. So you can't get this heterogeneity out of Nash equilibrium. It's very natural, a self confirming equilibrium.
So that raises the questions, you know, how much experimentation will agents actually choose to do? And which information sets will they learn about? Yep. So there's different approaches. The approach I'm going to take in this lecture is you know, very classical, Bayesian rational learning. So the agents are utility maximizers. They know they'll play the game many times. Each time they'll play against a different opponent from this large population, so we're not trying to play a repeated game. They know the extensive form of the game. They don't know their opponent's strategies. They're trying to learn the opponent's strategies. Because of this large population, the agents believe a distribution of play is exogenous. So you trying to learn what the player twos do, you, don't you can influence player two's action, because two's strategy might say, if up, then down, if A, then B. So by choosing your action, you influence his action, but there's some fixed distribution of strategies of player twos in the population you're not trying to influence. You're trying to learn it, and your beliefs about this distribution are asymptotically empirical. Once you've got enough data, beliefs match the data, match the empirical frequencies of the data. So then, each agent faces a version of what's called the multi-armed bandit problem. Okay? So on the, because there might still be a few undergraduates um, left of a lecture, um, let me explain this. This is a basic, basic term that you know, I think all economics undergraduates should know. It seems to not be widely, widely taught. So a, a one-armed bandit um, is a slot machine, a, a gambling machine. And, and, Las Vegas. You have these things, you put in coins, and you pull the handle, and the things spin, and if you're lucky, money comes out. I, I don't know what you call that in the UK, but so it's slot machines, yeah? Um, they're, they're, they're bandits, because they rip you off. They're one-armed, because you're just pulling this, this arm, okay? So, there's a classical problem in statistical decision theory of what's the optimal behavior in these bandit problems, and it's the result that in bandit problems, if the agent's patient, it will typically do some experimenting with choices that don't maximize the current period's expected payoff for the information value. So let me illustrate. Here's a very simple one-armed bandit. You can play in or out. If you play out, you get one for sure. You don't know the payoff to in. Either in always pays you two, or it always pays you zero, okay? So if you only play once, and the probability of always, uh, sorry, so, let me correct the slides. If you only play once, and the probability of this two payoff, not always it, the probability that the arm pays two is 0.4, then you choose out. Why? Out gives you one, and in gives you 0.4 times two. But suppose that the agent plays re repeatedly, okay? Only gets to see the outcome if he pulls the arm. You play out, you don't get to see what would have happened if you played in. And suppose that the future payoffs are discounted by 0.9 per period. That's an infinite horizon, stationary, dynamic programming problem. If you always play out, your payoff is 10 per, pe per period. Uh, no, it's one per period, second typo. Sorry, it's one per period divided by 0.1 because that's the um, one minus 0.9. So value of 10, I got the answer right. Details in the middle. Um, if you always play in, well, 0.4 of a time, that's a good idea. And then you get two per period for a value of eight. Eight's less than 10, so that's the one versus 0.8 comparison before. But something else you could do that would be more clever you could try in once, and if it gives you the two, aha, I'll stick with in, gives you the out, you play zero. So what does that give you? Well, with 0.6 probability, um, the arm gives you zero today, therefore you switch to out in the future. So you get one per period starting tomorrow. So the value of one per period starting tomorrow is 0.9 times 10. Okay. With probably 0.4, you get two. You say, oh, hallelujah, and you s stick with that arm, so you have 0.4 times 20. You add it up, it's 13.4. So it's better to play in once and then 
switch if you get a low payoff than to play either always in or always out. So here playing in is what I mean by an experiment. It's an action that's being taken that does not maximize the current period's expected payoff. In terms of current period, in gives 0.8, out gives 1. If you're only playing once, you play out. But it's still optimal to play in once for the information value. Okay, note, in relation to my 1 over t assumption, that for a given prior and almost every discount factor, the agent is going to strictly prefer one of those three strategies. You won't randomize. Now, randomizing can't help you in a decision problem. If you happen to be exactly indifferent, you might, but you, you won't randomize. So this, this 1 over t thing, you know, it's, it's very convenient. It's not even close to what rational agents do. Things are a bit more complicated if the true payoff is stochastic. So instead of it being always 2 or always 0 on, the, on this risky arm, we'll say, well, in the good state of the world, playing in gives 2.8 of a time, ID, and um, 0 the rest. But in the other state of the world, you get um, the good payoff with only probably 0.2. So what I've done in the previous example, there's two states of the world. Either you have probably one of the good payoff or probably zero. Now there's two states of the world, probably 0.8 of the good payoff or probably 0.2. So now it's, you pull the arm once and it gives you the bad payoff. Does that mean it's a bad arm? Well, it's not sure. It's not good news, but it's not determinate because you could have gotten unlucky, okay? So sufficiently patient agents will still do some experimenting. They'll play in. A sufficiently long string of bad outcomes, if you play in, you play in, you play in, it's always being zero. Eventually you get fed up and you start playing out. Once you start playing out, you get no more information, so you keep on playing out. So it's called locking on to a safe arm. And if there's some noise in the payoff, then even if it's true that the expected value of in is greater than that of out, the expected value of in is more than, than one, it's still possible you'll get some string of outcomes that makes you think it's, it's a bad choice and stop playing it. So agents can lock on to the wrong arm, even if they're rational. But the probability that this happens depends on the discount factor. The more patient the agent is, the more it's willing to keep on pulling the risky arm just in case. So the lower the probability that you'll be locking on incorrectly to the safe arm. So that's bandit problems, and that really gives a, the intuition for what happens in games. So from this, this discussion, We'd expect that once our agents in the game have enough data, they'll play a, a myopic best response. They might experiment early, but eventually they, they stop. Because okay? once you have a lot of data, there's not much information value in one more data point. So why pay much for it? And you could also hope that if agents are patient, they'll do lots of experimenting and will learn the play at the relevant information sets. Just like in the bandit problem, if agents are patient, they're unlikely to incorrectly lock on. They're likely to make the correct choice. Okay, so we could conjecture that, in general, Bayesian learning leads to self-confirming equilibrium for any discount factor. People learn the path, at least. And that these self-confirming equilibria that aren't Nash should go away if only players are patient enough. In order to make that in anything approaching a theorem, I have to be a bit more concrete about the model. So this is a model um, Dave Levine and I developed, steady state learning. So it's a continuum population of agents. There's a unit mass of player ones, a unit mass of player twos. The agents live capital T periods in overlapping generations. So some fraction of them die each period and replaced by new ones. And each period, we match up the player ones and player twos to play the game. And when you play the game, you don't know the 
age, the game age of your opponent. You're a player one, they're a player two, you play. And you don't see their strategy, you see the, their actions at the information sets that are reached. And we match people sort of uniformly. So if, if t equals two, half the people are old, half are young, you have equal chance of meeting an old person or a young person. So this system has a steady state. So it's maybe a bit funny that we could study learning in a model with steady states. It's an analytic convenience. The first thing, the continuum assumption, lets us get rid of any randomness from the matching and learning with the law of large numbers. Identify random variables with the expectations. So that explains why the process will be deterministic. Now, ordinarily with learning, you know, if an H is learning more and more, then you might think they're getting to infinite information asymptotically. So there's no steady state to hit, because you could creep up towards it, but you don't get there. How do you actually have a steady state? Well, if people are learning things, information is being added to the system. So we need to take information out of the system. So how do we get rid of the information? Well, people are leaving the system. The agents, when they get the capital T, they die, or they're mind wiped, which is equivalent, and their data leaves. So if we have sort of outflow of information, it's possible to have a steady state. It's sort of a trivial theorem. The system always has a steady state for any lifetime. If a lifetime is one, the steady state is really pretty boring. We have these Bayesian agents with priors. <laughs> Given their prior, they compute the myopic best response to the distribution. They play it, they leave. Right? You can't learn anything with one data point. So that's, that's sort of boring. Um, our results focus on the other extreme when the lifetimes are really large. So most players have really big data sets. It would be interesting, something we haven't gotten around to doing, to try and get results for like t equals 5 or 10. So there's a non-trivial share of new players. If you want to think about describing play in a you know, po poker game or something, then the optimal play isn't necessarily a play against something everyone's expert. You know, a certain fraction of the population you know, doesn't understand the game very well. You might want to change your play to take advantage of them. That's not going to happen in the limit as t goes to infinity, but it could happen for t equals 5. Anyway, we're not going to do that. Um, results. Any limit of steady states as the lifetimes grow long must be a self-confirming equilibrium. Now note, the priors of our agents are exogenous, as usual in sort of Bayesian models. Different priors can lead to different steady states. Think back to some of those, to a coordination game. You know, if the game has two equilibria, up left and down right, and people start out believing, oh, we're probably playing up left, then they'll play up left, they'll see up left, and that would be what happens. If for some reason they started out believing we're playing down right,
Okay? Why? Because just which equilibria rise depends on what players learn about nodes two or more steps off the path of play. The pr we prove it they're Nash by proving they will learn what happens one step off the path. What do they learn two or more steps off the path? So the full answer is not known. It's only known for a restricted class of games called simple games. These are games of perfect information, which means that every information sets a singleton, or more prosaically, it's people take turns and the actions are observed. So chess is a game of perfect information. Bridge is not. Um, a node X is one step off the path of a strategy profile if it's an immediate successor of a node that's on the path. So if on-path nodes are reached with positive probability, and if nodes that could, are one step off the path would mean that there's an action someone could take on the path that would cause this, this node to be reached. Profile S will be called a subgame confirmed Nash equilibrium. If it's first of all, it must be a Nash equilibrium. And one more requirement. In each subgame that starts one step off the path, play restricted um, to that subgame must be a self confirming equilibrium. So that's sort of a maybe confusing definition. I'll, I'll try and explain it motivated. It's, if you're familiar with subgame perfection, this has a little bit of a flavor. Subgame perfection says play is Nash in every subgame. So there's two differences here. We aren't saying anything about every subgame, only subgames one step off the path. And we're not saying Nash in the subgames one step off the path. We're saying self confirming in the subgames one step off the path. And the result is that in these simple games, a pure strategy subgame confirmed equilibrium is a limit of steady states. So this is the converse result. If it's a pure strategy subgame confirmed equilibrium, then it must, then we can find beliefs that make it a limit of steady states. And the intuition for this, players who move on the path of play experiment. They're patient, they play a lot. They learn what happens if they deviate, which is the nodes one step off the path of play. Players one step off the play, even if, they, even, if they, even if they don't experiment, they're reached a lot. So they learn what happens if no one else deviates from there on. But, and now we come back to my question of how much experimentation player two would do in an off-path node, these off-path players needn't experiment at all. Why not? Because they get to play too rarely to make experimentation worthwhile. So if, if you're player two who is sitting at this off-path information node, and let me simplify by going back to this heuristic rule of one experiment is probably one over t, then two is reached infinitely often. Okay? If two does not experiment, two does not learn three's play. Should two experiment? Well, if player one only very occasionally plays B, then the expected waiting time till player two gets to play again is very high. That means that you know, if, if this, I need another letter, W. If the, if the waiting time W is big, then the discount factor delta of a W is very small. So if you're sitting on an off-path node, if it's only reached if someone else experiments, there's no point in your experimenting yourself. So, in the example, so if two had experimented half the time, would have learned three's play. Or if three experimented at rate, you know, square root of t, and two experimented at rate square root of t, then this would be one of t would be fine. But in fact, the theorem says two does not experiment. Or can choose not to can't, but it's consistent with Bayesian rationality for two to choose not to experiment, even if two is very patient. And what I want to leave you with is the thought that this, this theorem could help explain the apparent durability of one of Hammurabi's codes. So this, here's, here's a code. This is, one of these things. this is written on a giant stone, you know, stella in uh, cuneiform and then translated, of course, not by us. Um, 
here it goes, if anyone bring an accusation against a man, and the accused go to the river and leap into the river, if he sink in the river, his accuser shall take possession of his house. But, if the river prove the accused is not guilty, and he escape unhurt, then he who brought the accusation shall be put to death, and he who leaped in the river shall take possession of the house that belonged to his accuser. So it seems sort of silly, but you know, this Hammurabi's government was around for a while, and this was worth their time to like inscribe this on these stone things, and so what's going on? Well, one thing that jumps to mind, you know, if everyone was completely honest, you wouldn't bother with all this rigmarole. You know, if you saw a crime was committed, you'd report it truthfully. It looks like this code is giving people incentives for only making true accusations and not false accusations. So why is that? You know, suppose that you saw some robbery being committed, you know, and you know who did it. You've got this really noisy upstairs neighbor. You'd really like them to be out of town for a year or two. You know, so if they just ask you who did it, you could, oh, my neighbor, you know, did it. So there's an incentive problem. Okay, that's, the other thing this shows, it, this, this code seems to rely on a superstition that guilty people are more likely to drown than innocent ones. Right, so it's, it's it, and I'm calling it superstition, I doubt it's true. You know, so, so maybe this is a correct belief. I'm, let's suppose that, that, that in fact this is not true. Okay? So, but if there's no limits on superstitions, you know, you could have saved lots of wages for stone crafters. You've written something much shorter on the, on the stone. But here's an easier superstition. Anyone who commits a crime is struck dead by lightning. Okay, that's, you know, short to the point, no crimes, right? So if there's no constraints on superstitions, we could use quite simple ones. So our explanation is that the wrong belief in this lightning strike superstition is only one step off the path of play. So if, we, if you believe a superstition, there's no crimes. But what's the experiment? Well, some young kids aren't quite sure they commit a few crimes. They're not struck by lightning, the whole thing unravels, okay? In the Hammurabi superstition, the wrong belief is actually two steps off the path. Because the people who have the wrong beliefs here aren't the criminals, it's the accusers, right? If the accusers be believe this superstition and report truthfully, there won't be any crimes. So it's the accusers who have the wrong beliefs, but the accusers only get to act, we'll assume, when a crime's committed. So, so maybe you could fabricate evidence and, and accuse people when there's no crime. It's more likely something's missing and you can say who did it. If there's a dead body, you say who did it. You, it's hard to say that you saw a crime, you saw a murder when there's no body, okay? So if people believe the superstition, in our model, what would that mean? Well, the, there'd still be a few crimes, but it'd only be the young people who, who committed these crimes, which means it'd be quite rare because most people aren't young people. So the, the accusers would only get to play very rarely, so there'd be no, there'd be no information value in, for the accusers in experimenting with false accusations. Okay? Now, the model's very stark and simple. You say, how could you, you know, use this to think about this real world problem? And in practice, there could be other sources of experimentation. So in our model, the only experiments the only time there's crimes is someone chooses to do it for the information value. There could be exogenous experimentation. For example, suppose the payoff functions aren't fixed, they're stochastic. And some people, when they're young, you know, have a short-run benefit from crime. They think crime pays, okay? Or they're just crazy. So if there's some fraction of these, of these exogenous experiments, that changes the calculation. And if enough, if there's enough exogenous crimes, then the accusers will make some experiments and the thing unravels. Um, but in the US today, the probability of being called as a witness is quite small. Okay? So most US citizens aren't called even once in their lifetime as a witness in a trial. So if you are called as a witness in a trial, you know, what's your incentive to experiment with things to get information that will help you the next time you're a witness? Okay? So hopefully for most of you, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a very small number. Um, so witnesses, in fact, don't have much incentive to experiment here, and we suggest that the same was true in Babylonia. So summary, false beliefs, 
two or more steps off the path can persist for much longer periods than false beliefs about play zero or one steps off the path. So our formal model, you know, as all models, is simplified and stark. And it says false beliefs two steps off persist forever. So I don't literally believe that, and there's a number of chuckles about, about this code, but the, the, the takeaway that this is more that these false beliefs two steps off the path can survive much longer than false beliefs one step off. And, um, okay. and that could be linked to this appeal to the river superstition. And overall conclusion, if equilibrium is the result of learning, as I've argued, then just what sort of equilibrium we should expect depends on what players observe when the game is played. You change what they observe, you change the nature of the possible steady states. The nature of equilibrium, what's the right equilibrium concept, in my view, should be a theorem derived from assumptions about learning and not an axiom. So I've had some discussions with, with some of the faculty here these last few days about equilibrium. What's a good equilibrium assumption? I say, well, what kind of learning process do you have in mind? And will it lead, you know, what steady states will it lead to? I think that's the way to, the best way to understand equilibrium concepts and these sort of these axiomatics, um, much harder, much harder to evaluate. So in particular, if players have little prior information about opponents' payoffs, so here I'm, which is what I've been talking about mostly today, as opposed to this paper that I um, brushed over, and also do not experiment, as they would not do if they were impatient, then learning theory points not to Nash equilibria, but to self-confirming equilibria, because it allows these incorrect off-path beliefs. Although it self-confirming equilibria reduces back to Nash equilibria if we happen to be looking at a one-shot simultaneous move game. Um, on the other hand, if players play many times and they're very patient, or if it's, you know, other sources of information, so players can get information not only from their own play, but their parents and grandparents, information accumulates, then the learning theory can lead not to self-confirming, throw out the non-Nash and have Nash, but then throw out some of the Nash equilibrium and end up with the sub-game confirmed equilibrium. But unfortunately, that conclusion has only been proved for simple games. And the implications of patient rational learning in general games, you know, that's, that's up for grabs. And thank you very much. <laughs>